Jesus.
morning, everybody. Welcome to another lecture for physics in everyday life and conceptual physics. We are definitely counting down towards the end Got this week and next week, uh, and then we will be done, except for a small thing called the final exam. Hope you are all doing reasonably well out there. Uh, in this particular uh, lecture, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the physics behind ultimately how eyeglasses or contact lenses work. I don't know how many of you wear those. Um, I myself am nearsighted, so I have contact lenses in most of the time. I do also have glasses, but don't usually wear them uh, much other than in the evenings or something like that at home. Um, if you have a lens at home that you can do a little experiment with, it might be a little more enjoyable for you than just watching this. So I uh, grabbed a magnifying glass that we have here at home. Um, and if you have something like that, you can do the experiment that I'm going to do uh, in a little bit. Um, if you are, uh, if you have glasses, obviously there's a lens in there. Uh, just a point is that more commonly, especially in this age range, folks are nearsighted. And if you are nearsighted, uh, the lenses in your glasses are actually something known as a diverging lens. And so they won't work. Uh, to do the little experiment we're going to do here in a bit, but we have a simulation version of that um, that you can play around with when we get to that point. Um, before we move on, I suppose, and just talk about the uh, lecture, I just want to say that over the weekend, I graded exam three, and so exam three is now in the grade book. You can look and see how you did on that. Uh, again, in, in Blackboard, it graded it out of the whole full 160 points. And in fact, even if you skipped questions, I manually entered those as zeros or else Blackboard tells me I haven't finished grading the exam. Uh, but then what I did is I went back through each exam and I tallied up the score the way we would do in a quote unquote normal exam in the classroom. So however many points you earned over however many points you attempted turned into the percentage score that's reported as exam three. And that's the one that's factoring into your grade right now. So I would encourage you to look back through the exam. Uh, you should be able to see feedback in the exam on the questions. Uh, and if something got graded incorrectly or you feel you were deserving of more partial credit on one of the short answer essay kinds of questions, uh, you can reach out and let me know and we can certainly talk about that. So last time we talked about uh, basically uh, LEDs and lasers, that diodes again are these devices in electrical circuits that only allow electric current to go one direction. Uh, but there's an energy transition within the flow through a diode from a high energy state to a low energy state. And so if you engineer the diode out of the right materials during that transition, you can produce photons and those photons can be in the visible light range. And so a diode can be used to produce light. And that's where uh, the light is in all of the LED devices that are becoming more and more popular. Um, in terms of lasers, when you have a uh, a photon emitted from an atom, it could do so um, spontaneously, which is the name we give for when the atom is in a higher energy state and then just spontaneously goes down to a lower energy state and emits a photon. However, with a laser, if while it's in the higher energy state, you hit it with another photon, you can get something called stimulated emission, which produces two photons that are identical to each other. And if you do this effect over and over and over again, you get this exponential growth of identical photons. And that is ultimately what is in a coherent laser beam. Uh, and this is, you know, amplifying the light when you are emitting photons from atoms that were pre-excited by generally some other photons from a flash lamp. Finally, uh, you have lasers that have multiple energy states, but you really have only one energy gap that corresponds to the energy that you want to produce these laser photons at. And so the key to this is getting a material that has a long lifetime at the top of that energy gap. And all the other energy levels within this laser material have relatively short lifetimes. So that most of the time when you have a photon running into this atom, that atom will be in the energy state that corresponds to where it needs to be to produce um, the particular wavelength of light you want in this laser beam. All right. So today, uh, still about light, but uh, perhaps a, I don't know if this is less abstract, but I find this more accessible to understand than understanding, say, the operation of a laser or a diode. Um, we're going to go back and revisit light and uh, specifically something called the Ray model of light. So 
for most light sources, we say that light travels in all directions. So, uh, you know, I think, in fact, even the magnifying glass my daughter lent me has a light source and light shines off in all directions from this thing. Um, but it's sometimes uh, helpful to not focus on what the whole thing is doing. So a few observations, like it's dimmer the further you are from a source. I think most people that makes uh, sense. The energy is spreading out over a larger and larger area. Light usually seems to travel in a straight line. And so you can, you know, if you look around you and see the light sources in the room, you can trace a straight line from that light source to your eye where you are observing that light source. And so to help us, and actually, frankly, to make it easier, because drawing wave pictures can be really hard, uh, we have something called the ray model of light, which is you draw a straight line uh, that is along the path that light is traveling and use an arrow to indicate the direction that light is traveling. But then you can draw that up to, say, a boundary between materials and illustrate with some new rays which way the reflected portion of the light goes, which way the transmitted portion of the light goes. We used this bending light simulator about a week ago uh, in the lecture here, and uh, I would again encourage you to go there and just play around with it for a couple of minutes. It's linked on the thing there uh, in the slides, if you're following along in the slides. If not, it's in the announcements. Uh, and if you want to watch me experiment with these light rays within that simulator, I've recorded a short video of that. Okay, so once we've established the idea of, hey, you can represent light with rays, you can actually trace these rays uh, in a variety of systems and use them to think about how an image is formed. So I'm going to start with actually a place that we're probably most familiar with forming images, and that is a plain mirror, a flat mirror like you look at in the bathroom each morning. Uh, and uh, how does light interact with the mirror? Well, clearly this is a boundary where almost all the light, in fact, we're going to treat it as all the light gets reflected and none of the light gets transmitted because we have silver paint painted on the back of that glass surface. Um, and so... Uh, when light hits a surface, again, a portion is reflected at an angle equal to the angle of incidence, but in a mirror specifically, we say that's a 100% portion that gets reflected. Um, and so the question is, how do these reflected rays create images? What's going on uh, with the way the light bounces off the mirror? And then to the observer, who's again on the same side of the mirror, where does it appear that that light that bounces off the mirror has come from? So this is another place where I think it's really helpful to play around with a simulator to sort of illustrate the path of all of these things. And certainly it can be drawn on a computer much more uh, precisely and with more detail than I can do it just scribbling out on a piece of paper. So I'm going to recommend that you go to this O physics simulation that has a plane mirror in it. Uh, and uh, you can click, and if you click through sort of in the order of the bottom check marks, uh, you build the complexity of the simulation. So you can show, for example, rays that come off of that object. And the simulation uses a blue arrow as the object that come off of there and then hit the mirror. What do they look like when they're reflected? Uh, what do they look like? And if you want to, you can turn on something called a normal so you can compare the angles of incidence and reflection. But then make sure that you turn on something called the virtual rays because this is... Uh, an extension of the ray that is reflected back behind the mirror where it would appear to have come from if you did not know there was a mirror there or if the reflection event had not happened. And it's actually the convergence of these virtual rays that in a plane mirror and in some lens systems tells us where the image is located. Again, I think you'll probably get more out of it if you play around with the simulator yourself. It's linked on the picture there on the Google Slides or in the announcements. But if that's not a possibility for you, or if you'd rather watch me play around with a simulator, that's what the YouTube video is embedded uh, in this slide for. All right, so we also have made mention of this in the past, and we want to talk a little bit more about the phenomena of refraction. Again, refraction is what's going on when you stick, say, a spoon down in your water glass, and it appears that the spoon looks somehow different underneath the water. That's due to the fact that light is getting bent as it's traveling through the various media. So for you to see a spoon, light has to go from somewhere in the room, through the glass, through the water, to the spoon, bounce off the spoon, back through the water, back through the glass, back through the air, and then into your eye. And so it's gonna undergo a lot of transitions from one material to another along that chain. 
Uh, and when light travels from one material to another, it generally gets bent. The angle that it goes at changes. Now, there's a thought experiment that some people find helpful for understanding this. If you think about um, four-wheeling and for some reason you had four independently turning wheels on your device. So it's a little bit hard because that's not how most cars are engineered. Uh, but let's say you were driving on grass and you were driving along at an angle. So my little sketch there is the top-down view of a hypothetical car and four wheels in that car. The axles, by the way, actually are paralleling the idea of a wave front for a wave. And that line, that dashed line that I've drawn on the picture is the direction that a ray would be traveling in the light model. So when you get there, uh, if this is a top-down view, think about which tire is going to hit the mud first. Well, from my view, if I imagine being there, it's going to be the front right or the passenger side right tire that will hit the mud first. And it's because mud is more slippery, that tire will start slipping a little bit. And it'll have the whole effect of making the whole axle turn uh, a bit because you get less grip in the mud than you do on the grass. So halfway through that transition, that front axle has turned uh, until both tires are in the mud and then both tires start to move at similar speeds forward. Similarly, when the back one hits, the back right tire would hit the mud first and start slipping. So that would have the effect of turning that axle. And overall, uh, if you did no adjustments and if you know you had perfectly uniform mud and perfectly uniform grass, your whole vehicle would have turned and now be driving a new angle. It would be going slower because the tires would be slipping more in the mud and it would have changed to an angle that in the language of physics we say is closer to the normal, closer to an imaginary vertical line that bisects that surface or that boundary rather between the grass and the mud. So if you want to explore this a little bit more, uh, there's a guy named Walter Fent who probably 30 years ago made a website of tens and tens of if not hundreds of physics simulations. He's German, so the default website is in German, but he's got an English translation and a half a dozen, well, actually I think 12 or 15 other languages too. Um, and there's a little animation that illustrates this reflection and refraction of light waves uh, that is explained by the Huygens principle. Uh, and certainly if you want to uh, play around with that simulator, you can. Um, and I'm seeing in the recording of this that I did not embed my YouTube video on here unless it's building later and I forgot about that. Um, but by the time you see these Google Slides, there'll be a little YouTube embedded on this slide. And if you want to watch that simulation recorded, uh, you can do so as well if they want to help a visualization of wave fronts turning as they encounter the boundary between two media. Last thing, um, lots of physics books, conceptual physics books, ask questions similar to this, right? Like, I don't know how desperate things will be getting in the coming weeks, but say you have to eventually resort to spearfishing. Uh, if you are spearfishing and you see a fish in the pond, where should you throw your spear? Uh, and the idea here is that how does light get to you to see the fish? Well, light comes from the atmosphere into the water, reflects off the fish. But then the path that light takes in order for you to see the fish is from the fish up to the surface of the water. But then because it's going into air, which is a less dense medium, it's like the mud grass picture backwards, the angle that that light takes bends away from the normal or towards the surface. And so it travels to your eye here. But to you, the observer, you think light is traveling in a straight line. So it's going to appear like the fish is actually above where uh, the fish is located there. And so if you are spear fishing, here's a pro tip for the days to come, aim high when you are throwing something into the water. Uh, actually aim low because the fish is actually below where it appears to your eye to be. So a similar question, uh, but we threw this on the Pole Everywhere survey. If Okay, instead of spear fishing, you decide to get fancy and use your laser gun. Where should you aim if you're using your laser gun in this? So uh, if you are watching on the video, I would encourage you to pause it, go to the Pole Everywhere survey and put in what you think is the best answer here. Should you aim below the apparent position of the fish, above the apparent position of the fish, and, or directly at the fish? I'm not going to answer the question here, but I'm going to hint to you that a laser beam is a beam of light. All right. So let's use this observation about light bending when it goes from one medium into another to track the path of light through a prism. We did this again a little bit uh, a week ago. 
I did it a little bit on the simulator that I just played around with, but if I have rays of light that encounter a prism, uh, those glass triangular things you may have played around with in a science class in the past, uh, I'm looking at a side view of the prism, and so as light hits that boundary, uh, I would, if I was doing this carefully, trace little normal lines, little lines that are perpendicular to the surface, and note that the angle that in the glass the light is going to take has to be at a smaller angle than the angle within the air. And that, coupled with the angle of the, the surface as it is, uh, means that I get those rays that were coming in to be refracted and bent downward. Then I would trace some new normal lines on the other side, and the light would furthermore get bent downward. And so the net effect is light comes into a prism, say, traveling horizontally, but then after it passes through the prism, it is now traveling in a downward direction. If I take one of those prisms and stack it on another prism, uh, I get a crude, very crude model of how a lens works, because light that comes in on the top of that system is going to get bent downwards. Light that comes in on the bottom is going to get bent upwards. And overall, on the other side of that system, those rays of light are going to cross each other. I'm not actually going to get a coherent image because of the angle there, but if I were to actually grind that so it's not triangle-triangle in a diamond shape, but rather a smooth, curved lens, I can get all those rays of light to come together in one point. Uh, and so that is a model of a converging lens, light that brings a, ray, a lens rather that brings light together to a single point. If you've got your magnifying glass, this is an example of a converging lens, and probably the easiest way to see this is if it's sunny today, take it outside, and you can focus the sun down to a spot uh, on the ground. You can be careful if you have a rather large magnifying glass, you can actually start a fire uh, fairly easily that way. So that's either a safety tip or a challenge, depending on how you uh, take that. So what would happen if you stacked the um, two prisms this way, tip to tip. Well, light that came into the top portion of that would get refracted up. Light that came into the bottom gets refracted down. And the net effect is that you have rays that are going away from each other. So this won't form what in the language of physics we would call a real image, an image that you could have show up on a screen or a piece of film in a camera or a photo sensor in a digital camera. But if you're an observer on the far side of this and you look at the light, it now appears to come from a different location than it actually came from, forming a virtual image. And so this is a diverging lens model. And if you have parallel light coming in on one side of the diverging lens, it bends away and it all appears to have come from a common point. That point is known as the focal point of the lens. So in the converging lens, the focal point is the real point. All the light comes to in a diverging lens, the focal point is the point where all the light appears to have originated from if that light was coming in uh, in parallel rays prior to encountering the lens. So this is the place that if we were back in Begeman Hall, we'd give you all some toys and ask you to do some lens experiments. Unfortunately, that's not a reality of our current situation. Um, but uh, we can. I'm going to walk through some of these pieces of the uh, experiment here with you. Uh, and then encourage you to use one of the three simulators that are linked here uh, to play around with it. They're all fairly similar to each other. The FET one uses Flash, so if that's a concern on your computer or you don't uh, have Flash installed, you might want to choose the Walter Fent or the O-Physics one. But they can all be manipulated in very similar ways and, and used to answer the question here at the bottom. But let's go in order. Using a light source and a screen only, try to find an arrangement that will produce an image of the bulb on the screen. So I... Uh, rigged my system here. I said, hey, I got a light source. This is my document camera that I am using to um, shoot video of, say, problem solving on here. It's got a little light bulb built into it, so when I turn that light bulb on, it probably overwhelms my camera. All you see is bright light, but if I turn it off, note that I've put a little um, uh, electrical tape arrow on there, and this is to help me try to form an image uh, later on my so and so, uh, my so-called screen. So my screen is going to be back here on my wall, and if I turn the light source uh, towards that and turn it on, notice my wall gets a little bit lighter, but I don't get any image of the arrow. And that's because the light from my light source is spreading out in all directions and it's hitting here, but I need to bring that light together if I'm going to form an image. So that's where my converging lens comes in. And again, I'm not sure exactly how clear this will come up 
uh, on the video, but you'll notice I got a nice spot of light on the wall back there. And if I get this in just the right location, you may be able to see that I'm forming a small image uh, of the arrow back here on the wall behind me. Now, it's not the super, uh, you know, focused image. So if you've been to an eye doctor and they're always asking you better here or here, this is pretty fuzzy, but, you know, it's just the proof of concept here. Uh, my wall is actually slanted with the angle that I'm trying to shoot all of this in. So I get a little arrow, and you may or may not be able to see this in the video, but that arrow is actually inverted. It's upside down. Uh, which is uh, a characteristic of producing this real image through a converging lens. Um, now, I don't have a diverging lens with me, but it turns out if I did, and if you have glasses and you're nearsighted, you could use your diverging lens like this. I'll never get this image back here because the diverging lens bends those light rays away from each other. However, if I put my eye over here and I look through the thing, uh, what that will do is make the image appear to have come from a different location than it does uh, if you're just looking at the object directly. All right, so now you're encouraged to change the object distance, so the distance between the light and the lens, and uh, see what effect that has on the image. Now, I could do that, but again, the video is going to be pretty poor on this end. Uh, I think this is a better thing seen through the simulators there. So again, I would encourage you to click on one of the linked simulators and play around with, okay, I got my object, got my image. What happens when I shift the location of the object? What happens to the location uh, of the image that gets formed as a result? Specifically, I'm encouraging you to experiment with the question of, will my Google slide uh, transition here, uh, to, to actually measure some distances. And so in all of these simulators, there's either a little ruler or a grid that can be used to actually measure how far is the object distance, how far is it from the object to the lens, and then how far is the image distance, how far is it from the lens out to where the image is formed. Uh, and I would encourage you to get a data set of doing that and see if you can find a relationship between object distance and image distance. When object distance increases, what happens to image distance? If you do not have the ability to do so or you just want to watch me do it, that's what the YouTube video there is for. I've done this using the FET uh, lens simulator and collected a data set. So the second and only other Poll Everywhere survey question for this particular lecture is asking you, how are the object distance and the image distance related? Are they directly proportional? And so when the object distance gets bigger, the image distance gets bigger. Are they inversely proportional? So as the object distance gets bigger, the image distance gets smaller. Or do they not seem to have any sort of predictable relationship? Turns out there is, in fact, a relationship. And you'll probably be unsurprised to think that uh, physics, we came up with a mathematical equation that matches uh, the uh, observations that we make here. Uh, and so the question, can you find any relationship between the object distance and the image distance, is characterized by something called the thin lens equation. If you are curious how you get that from the data, that's what the video linked on this slide will show you a kind of walk through how you could take your data from the simulator and manipulate it in a way to produce a graph that would generate the thin lens equation. Alternately, I'm going to put it here on the slide. It's also in Bloomfield's section uh, and it relates the three, uh, one over the object distance, how far the object is from the lens, plus one over the image distance equals one over the focal length. So it's a little bit odd. It has this uh, inverse term uh, arrangement, but you can use this if you know two of the three pieces of information about a lens system to predict what the third one is. If you like shorthand, uh, Bloomfield's going to use an O and an I for object distance and image distance. If you poke around on the internet, you're going to find three or four other ways people do this. Some people use S and S prime or little DI and DO symbols, but they all ultimately mean the same thing. The reason this is called a thin lens equation is it's predicated on the assumption that light only bends once when it goes through a lens. In truth, it bends twice, but since most of the lenses we're going to use are fairly thin, it's a reasonable approximation to assume it only bends once by the amount that ultimately it bends going through both of those surfaces. Uh, and so if you do something called ray tracing, which we won't focus on in this course, you end up actually only bending the ray once in your ray tracing drawing, and that's at the center of the plane of the um, lens there. All right, did a little bit of quantitative problem solving. Uh, this is a physics eyeball. 
ball of water and a lens out in front. That's sort of our crude model of an eyeball. But when I'm looking at something, I want to take light from that object, which is diverging, and then use the lens on my eye to bend the light back together and form an image on the retina at the back of my eye. So the question is, what focal length do I have to have in my eye in order to look at something that is 10 centimeters away? And then what do I need to have the focal length of my eye be to look at something that is 100 meters away, which is impossible in this basement, but if I went outside, I could probably pull off. If you would like to solve this problem, that'd be fantastic. You use the thin lens equation that was on the previous slide. If you'd like to watch me walk through the solution of this, that's what the YouTube video is linked for. All right, so finally, we've come to where we can talk about these vision deficiencies and then how you use a lens to correct them. So some people uh, in the world are uh, hyperopic in the language of optometry. Uh, and what does that mean? It means that your eye can focus on things that are far away from you and see a clear image of things that are far away from you. But things that are close are difficult to see without some sort of vision correction. They appear blurry. And so the uh, photographer in the picture there has tried to mimic this by focusing on something that is in the distance, uh, leaving the sign that is close by uh, fairly out of focus. So this is called farsightedness in the common language. The reverse of this, myopia, nearsightedness, is where things that are relatively close to you appear sharp and focused, but things that are far away are out of focus and blurry. Uh, in general, um, I think most folks, especially on the younger curve of life, are nearsighted if you have a vision deficiency. Uh, though, talking to my eye doctor, he said that actually almost every baby starts out a little bit farsighted. Uh, most of us, as our eyes grow, uh, move into that nearsightedness for a while, and then later in life, often lose some of that and become more farsighted. Um, but uh, yeah, I was just intrigued that I didn't, how do you figure out that babies are farsighted? But somebody has done it. Um, okay, how do you use a lens to correct that? Well, if we draw again these ray diagrams of the eyeball, if I have a farsighted eye, what that means is my lens of my eye is not bending the light enough. And so rays that are coming from an object are diverging out in the air. When they come into the lens of my eye, my eye will then bend them and converge them towards each other, but it doesn't do so enough. And so if there was a clear image of this thing, it would be behind my eyeball. Well, my retina is not back there and I can't actually do that. So what it really means is the retina uh, sees a fuzzy image of this. What do you need to do to correct that? Well, you need to take that light that's coming in and bend it even more. And so you use a converging lens to accomplish that. And the focal length of the converging lens is chosen based on how farsighted your eye is and through a series of vision tests. But ultimately, the light bends through that converging lens and then again through the converging lens of your eye. And that twice bending event can be adjusted so that you get a sharp image focused on the retina on the back of your eye. If you are myopic or nearsighted, uh, it's kind of the reverse. Your eye is bending light too much. And so the light, again, shown here in a ray diagram, is diverging away from the point on a distant object. Your eye is bending it, but because it's bending it too much, the place where those rays are actually crossing and meeting within your eyeball is in front of your retina. And that means they've actually gone past each other and we're back into the domain where the image is a little bit blurry uh, by the time it forms an image on your actual retina. The way you correct that is you use a diverging lens. And a diverging lens takes that light from the distant object that's coming together, or that's rather spread apart, and then it hits the diverging lens and it spreads it apart even further so that when your eye receives that light and then bends it together, it does so and focuses it at the image point on the retina, and you again see a sharp image. Now you might be thinking, hmm, the bending of the lens, because a magnifying glass is very clear if you feel it, it's bowed outward in both directions. Um, and if you have eyeglasses, they're probably not, if you're nearsighted, they're not hourglass shaped profiled. Uh, in general, what they do is they curve one face of the lens with one radius of curvature, the other with a different radius of curvature. And if you are nearsighted, the bottom and top of your eyeglasses should be thicker than the middle, and it is ultimately a diverging lens, even though both surfaces are sort of curved uh, in the same direction. So that's what we wanted to talk about in uh, 
this lecture, and now I see the spinning beach ball of death. So we're going to see if I get to the last slide here, and I'm going to pause the recording momentarily. All right, I don't know what it is, but something about getting to the last slide in the last two lectures. I think I'm killing my four-year-old laptop here. Uh, here we talked a little bit about the light ray representation. They're straight line paths so that you can trace that portions of the light take, and they can help you understand how light interacts when it's traveling uh, specifically through one medium and into another. Uh, and the path uh, or the, the process rather of tracing these paths is known as ray tracing. You can actually do it with geometric rules and a piece of paper and a pencil and a ruler and a protractor. Uh, when light goes through a boundary between two media, it refracts and it's either bent towards the normal, towards a line perpendicular through the surface or away from it, depending on whether it's going from something that is less optically dense into more optically dense or more optically dense into less optically dense. And then ultimately we have converging lenses, which bend light towards the focal point or diverging lenses, which bend light away from a point that appears to be the focal point in that lens. And you can use both of those to correct deficiencies in your vision, depending on whether the lens in your eye is re already bending light too much or bending light too little to produce uh, nearsightedness or farsightedness. So that's it for today. If you've not done so, I would encourage you to look at section 14.1. Uh, Bloomfield uses the example of camera lenses to talk about some of the same concepts here. You could work through the chapter 14 practice problems if you find that helpful for you. Uh, and if you want to look ahead to what we're going to talk about on Wednesday, that is section 14.2.